viewers once again and welcome to my lectures in uh, theories on reality and for this uh, lecture i will uh, focus on aristotle's metaphysics so this will just be uh, some sort of a general uh, discussion on his metaphysics uh, but i will be discussing uh, the basic concepts of aristotle's metaphysics concepts like being substance uh, akin potency uh, matter in form changes uh, the categories and some other related concepts so let's start with a very general description of metaphysics metaphysics is that portion of philosophy which generally treats the most general and fundamental principles underlying all reality and all knowledge so there are many other terms that we associate with metaphysics we relate it with ontology or sometimes theo with theodicy we also relate it with cosmology even with epistemology but uh, these are the different branches of philosophy according to aristotle that are related to uh, metaphysics so let's uh, focus on the term metaphysics first the word metaphysics is formed from the greek term meta ta physica meta ta physica it's a title which was related by the librarian uh, andronicus of rhodes to that collection of aristotle's aristotle's works which were placed after the collections on physics so of course aristotle had many books and his books on physics were grouped in one part of the library and then the other books that were quite difficult to classify or categorize were placed by the librarian uh, after the books on physics that's why it is called meta which means after uh, the physics so meta the physica the books after the books on physics so that's how the uh, word metaphysics uh, originated but aristotle himself referred to that portion of philosophy as the theological science or the theologica because it culminated in the consideration of the nature of god or what god is and he also referred to it as first philosophy or proto philosophia because it considered the first causes of things and because in his own estimation it is first in importance so theologica and proto philosophia so these are the terms used by aristotle himself to refer to metaphysics so the term metaphysics is not an invention of aristotle it was rather uh, invented or uh, coined by uh, andronicus of rhodes the uh, librarian of the uh, library in alexandria so aristotle used the term theologia and protophilosophia in order to refer to metaphysics so the word metaphysics came much later on although uh, the title of the book of aristotle is metaphysics so what is the definition of metaphysics metaphysics is first of all the science of being as being now first a science seeks knowledge of things based on their in their causes so a science is a body of knowledge about the causes of things right but the definition of being as being combines both the material object and the formal object of metaphysics when you say material object that is the general uh, subject matter that a particular science studies like for example mathematics the material object of mathematics would be numbers 
What about the formal object? The formal object would be under what consideration does a particular science studies its material object? So, for example, in the case of mathematics, what what special consideration, what would be the features of numbers that mathematics is concerned about? So it specifies the, the focus of that particular science. So in the case of metaphysics, the material object is being, being. So by being, that would mean the whole world of reality, whether subjective or objective reality, uh, possible or actual rea reality, abstract or concrete, immaterial or material, finite or infinite, as long as it's being, it's part of the material object of <clears throat> metaphysics. Now, again, as I've said, the other sciences are restricted to maybe one or several departments of uh, being. Like, for example, uh, as we have mentioned, math would be uh, concerned with the numbers. Physics would be limited to the field of uh, uh, physical objects, for example, or the uh, uh, the properties of physical objects. Uh, so uh, th that's what that would be their material objects. Okay. Now, the formal object of metaphysics is being also beingness. So it's the study of being as being. So it studies being that's a material object. As a being, that would be the formal object. So, as again, as we've said, the formal object of the science is not particular consideration, particular face, would be a quality or aspect of things that this particular science is interested. So, again, for example, uh, a man is the science or the material object of many other sciences like psychology, sociology, anthropology, what else? Uh, so they are all interested in man. But the formal object of the sciences are different because like, like, for example, the material object of psychology would be the mental, you know, uh, aspect or the behavioral aspect of man. Uh, the formal object of ethics would be uh, the actions, the, the morality of the action of man. Uh, sociology would be interested in the relationship of man to his fellow men or to the society. So these are specific considerations. Okay. So metaphysics is concerned with being and its special focus is beingness. The, how does a be, how does, in what sense is a being a being? Of course, that's, that's a very, it's already a very abstract, very abstract uh, science. Now, the second is that metaphysics is the science of immaterial being. The science of immaterial being. So, as the first science, as uh, mentioned by us, according to Aristotle, metaphysics deals with things which are both separate from matter, meaning immaterial, and immovable so separate from matter that means immaterial and unmovable or immovable and there are two kinds of immaterial things first the immaterial quod esse quod esse which means they are immaterial beings as such like for example uh, god the human soul because they exist without matter. The second kind of immaterial beings are the immaterial quod conceptum or cons concepts, conceptual beings. Like, for example, the concept of substance, the concept of cause, the concept of quality. Okay, so these concepts, the comprehension of them does not involve matter. So, two immaterial beings, the uh, quod esse and quod conceptum. Okay? Immaterial beings per se and immaterial beings as concepts. Now, metaphysics in so far as it treats immaterial beings is called special metaphysics. 
Okay? And it can be divided into several uh, categories. Psychology treats the human soul. Uh, rational theology treats the existence and attributes of God. And cosmology treats uh, the ultimate principles of the universe. Okay? Now, but metaphysics, insofar as it treats of immaterial concepts, they could conceptum, of those general notions in which matter is not included, that is called general metaphysics or ontology, meaning the science of being. Okay? So, the term metaphysics in its broadest sense, which includes both the general and special metaphysics, is the science of immaterial. It means that whatever exists, whether it is immaterial being or material being, uh, <clears throat> considered as immaterial concepts, such as substance or cause. That's the general application of the term metaphysics. Okay. Now, third, metaphysics is a science of the most abstract conceptions. Scientific knowledge, per se, is knowledge of the abstract. There may be some other forms of knowledge, like, for example, our knowledge about how to do certain things, how to type, for example, how to write, how to, you know, perform some uh, manual, manual functions, manual activities. They are useful, but you don't call them scientific knowledge. At most, you can call them practical knowledge or practical, yeah, uh, practical knowledge or practical science, but it's not scientific because... Uh, when you say uh, scientific knowledge, it must be based on uh, reason. It must be based on, uh, it must be abstracted from what makes things to be an individual. It must be universal. Okay. It must know the general principles. So it's not just, so for example, uh, say you know how to fix a car. Well, you can really fix a car. But you must be able to know the principles behind fixing the car, the car. So when you know the theories, you know the principles, etc., the processes, the scientific processes, then that means you acquire a scientific knowledge. Okay? But when you say scientific, it will rely on abstract conceptions. So yes, it starts with uh, specific instances, particular individuals, but a science will move from particular instances, individual instances, to the general principles. And um, the transition from particular to the general principles is what is already considered to be scientific knowledge. Because when you understand now the general principles, then you can apply these general principles to specific or particular instances or particular objects. Now, there are three degrees of abstraction three levels of abstraction. First degree is found in the physical sciences, which abstract merely from the particulars, from the individual characteristics. Uh, of course, considering the general laws of principles, of, for example, motion, light, heat, substantial change, etc. Okay? So in the first degree of abstraction, you come up with the general principles of this particular phenomena, for example. The second degree of abstraction is found in mathematical sciences, which leave out of consideration both the individuating, so the, the, the mathematical uh, removes the individuating qualities, and the physical qualities of things, and only consider the quantity and its loss. So the quantity. So for example, uh, say, uh, in the sciences, in the physical sciences, you can probably describe what is heat. What is what are the general principles, the general qualities, or the general manifestations, the concepts relate, relative to heat. But when you try now to measure the degree, the temperature, then you are now into the mathematical science. You are now considering the quantity, not just the you don't just uh, you you leave out the individuating uh, qualities and physical qualities, 
but just focus on the quantity. The third degree of abstraction is found in metaphysics, which abstract not only the uh, physical qualities or individuating qualities, but also the mathematical qualities or the quantities. So what happens when you leave out all this, when you remove all this, then you have just the abstract concept of being, the being per se. So now metaphysics considers only being, it is highest manifestation, like substance, cause, quality, action, etc. So metaphysics is the most abstract of all because it does not consider that it removes not just the physical qualities or individuating qualities, but also the quantities, the numbers, and focus only on the being itself. Okay, so number four, metaphysics is a science of the most universal conceptions. Of course, from here, it, from the three uh, considerations, it follows that metaphysics consider the most universal conceptions. The science which deals with the most abstract conceptions must be the science of the most universal conceptions. Because, for example, say, uh, what is common among the things that you see in the universe? Well, they may differ in physical qualities, in, the, in individuating qualities. They may have different colors, you know, sizes, etc. And, of course, they have different quantities. But when you remove all this, you 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 draw out the particular qualities, even their quantities. What you can see common among them is that they are all here, meaning by being here, they all exist. So what is common among them is that they are being. So among our ideas, the most universal would be being because being applies to everything, everything, anything that exists. You don't apply, for example, particular qualities like colors to everything. You have different colors. Some, in fact, are do not have colors. You don't apply uh, the mathematical concepts to some things because some of them may not have quantities. They may just have quality, but they don't have quantities. But what is common among this is that they are being, they are all existing. So, most universal being and the determination of it, which we call transcendental. And we're going to discuss the transcendental later on. The being is the highest of consideration. Next in universality would be the highest determination of being like the genera or uh, yeah, uh, gen genera, the substance and accident. And you can also consider their uh, essence, existence, potency, actuality, etc. So these are the different levels of universalization. Now, finally, metaphysics is the science of the first principles. So every science, as we have said, would inquire about the causes and principles of things. But metaphysics inquire into the first principles, the highest causes both in the order of existence and in the order of thought. Remember, could uh, uh, the immaterial beings and the immaterial concepts, thoughts. So it is within the scope of metaphysics to inquire into the nature of cause and principles in general, to determine the meaning of the different kinds of causality, like the four causes, the formal the material, the efficient, and the final, to investigate the first principles in the order of knowledge and to establish the validity, for example, of the principles of identity and contradiction. So that is how Aristotle uh, uh, described or defined metaphysics. Now, let's move on to the next concept, the doctrine of being the notion of being. Uh, the three ideas which are most important in any system of metaphysics are being, substance, and cause. So this would be 
these are actually discussed by uh, Aristotle in his book Metaphysics, being substance and cause. Now, the central question in the Metaphysics, the book Metaphysics of Aristotle, is this: What is usia? Usia, O U S I A, usia. Now, translators and commentators of Aristotle claim that this is the same as the question, what is being? Okay? But of course, uh, there are many interpretations of the word, of the term osia, because even Plato used the word osia of being. But there's a difference between the notion of osia of Aristotle and the notion of osia or being of Plato. For Plato, just a uh, just very briefly, for Plato, when you say osia or being, it means a definite being, a definite existing substance, right? Like for example, a man, a horse, uh, a tree, a house, definite being. So it has its own existence, but being for Aristotle is much comprehensive because in in general being would be anything that exists and anything that exists is not just an actual being it could actually be a potential being or a conceptual being like the immaterial concepts so the question here of of Aristotle is what is usia what is being and being is in general, anything that exists. So that's very much different from the conception of Plato about being. Now, the description of being. Strictly speaking, the term being cannot be defined. Because when you say definition, a real definition must be by proximate genus and ultimate difference. So what is the what is the proximate genus or the genera? The genera is the quality of the being or a thing that makes it similar to other beings. Okay? But how can you make being similar to other beings when everything is being? So they are all similar. And the specific difference is the quality that would make that particular being different from other beings. But how can you differentiate being in general from other beings when everything is being so being strictly speaking cannot be defined because it has the widest extension and cannot be included in any genus because it is the genus already and secondly a definition is the analysis of the comprehension of a concept so but being has the least comprehension it has the least comprehension because it is as it were indivisible in its comprehension and it rests all it resists all efforts to resolve it into simpler thought elements because when you say comprehension you're actually giving some thought elements like for example how you do you define a ball pen then you're going to conceive of some thought elements of ball pen like it is a writing instrument it has a ballpoint it is a, it has ink so you divide you present thought elements in order to comprehend what a ballpen is. But what about being? What comprehension can you give to being other than anything that exists and therefore anything becomes being? However, being can be described. Okay, So the term being can be taken either as a participle or as a noun. And as such, it has reference to the act of existence. Meaning it 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 exists. It has existence. But remember, existence could either be real or meaning actual or potential. So we will go later on to the notion of act and potency. So whatever exists, therefore, is being. So as we've said, that's the general description of being. Whatever exists is being. Whether it exists in the mind or outside of the mind, whether it has actual or only potential existence, 
whether it requires a subject in which to inhere or is capable of subsisting without a subject of inherence. Meaning, like for example, a substance exists in itself, but the, the accidents like qualities, like colors, cannot exist in itself. It has to exist in something else. But just the same, it has the capacity to exist. So the broadest divisions of being are notional, meaning uh, it exists only in the mind, and rationis, and real, meaning it exists independently of the created world, meaning ens real or ens reale. So ens rationis, ens reale, meaning conceptual and real. Now, real being is further divided into the potential and the actual. So in the real world, the, the real world extends far beyond the actual world of our experience or even of possible experience. So the real is not just the, well, first of all, the real would include actually existing being, like the things that we see here around us, the actual existence. But beyond this realm of actually existing things, there is a world of tendencies, of possibilities, potencies, which are truly real. So for example, uh, say the adult person or when you become adult or when you become old, this ad the adult person is really present, but it may just be potentially present in the child. So, for example, what you will be in the future is potential, but it is actual in you. And it has the capacity to be actualized later on. The painting is really real, though it may just only be potentially present in the mind of the artist. Okay? A, a song may just potentially be present in the mind of the composer or the songwriter. It's still there in the mind, but it's real. It's potential. It may not be actual, but it has the capacity, the potentiality to be there. Okay? So, uh, so bef be before an effect, and of course the, the, the outcome, the effect, because before it can be actual, it is really present in the cause, in the measure in which its actual existence depends on the cause, meaning the actual existence of a song will depend, of course, in the mind of the songwriter. So, real objects are not just the actual existing objects, because potential objects are also real. Real in the sense that it has the capacity, the potentiality to be. Now, Let's go to the relation of being to other concepts. Well, in scholastic philosophy in general, following, of course, Aristotle, uh, his doctrine that all ideas are acquired through the senses, the first knowledge which we, we acquire is sense knowledge, of course. All right? So nothing in the mind that did not pass through our senses. Out of the material uh, or the data, the information provided by the senses, the mind elaborates or forms the concepts or the ideas. So from our experience, from our sense experience, uh, we, are, we gather information, we gather physical qualities, and the... Uh, so the first of these ideas is the most general, namely the idea of being. So that's the first concept or first idea. Being. So in the sense, the idea of being or the idea of something is the first of all our ideas. So whether we form, for example, the idea of a laptop, the idea of books, gadgets, the first idea, the most general of the idea is that this laptop or this concept, or sorry, this laptop or, or this animal or this book or gadget is a something. It is a being in the first place. It exists in the first place. Now, what about being and nothing? Because uh, we, 
in philosophy, we always juxtapose or relate being and nothing. Being has a comprehension, meaning uh, we, we have understanding of what being is. We can form some elements, like the comprehension of being is that which exists. Though it is the least of all comprehension because, well, we can only think of being as anything that exists. But it is definite. Therefore, it is not a bare, empty concept which we can say equal to nothing. So being is not nothing because being is here. Being is, you know, exist. Nothing does not exist. If you go back to our discussion on the Persocratics, especially the Parmenidean argument, anything that exists is being. And anything that does not exist is nothing. And we cannot think or speak of nothing because it's void. However, there are philosophers, there are philosophical systems that equate being with nothing because they have they have different interpretation of what being and nothing is. But let's, for, for example, let's focus on the Hegelian notion of being and nothing. In the, in the scholastic following the Aristotelian sense, when they say being, being is always definite. It has its own existence. Okay. Now, the Hegelian, on the other hand, teaches us differently. It has a different position. Aristotle teaches that being has a definite comprehension. And therefore, the fundamental law of thought, as well as the basic principle of reality, is that uh, the identity of being is with itself. Being is being. Like, for example, A is A, or everything is what it is. Now, Hegel does not deny this Aristotelian principle. It is true that being is being, A is A, everything is what it is. However, according to Hegel, being has an indeterminate comprehension. So it's different. Aristotle says being has a determinate comprehension because it says anything that is, exists. Or any A is A, and so on. So for Hegel, being has an indefinite or indeterminate uh, comprehension. And a comprehension that is dynamic, or let's say a, a comprehension that would be, you know, uh, extensive or comprehensive enough to include some other things. So when you say being is, a is A, or everything is what it is. That's only part of the truth. Because the other part of the truth is that being is also equal to nothing. Okay? So A, while A is A, A is not, can also be not A. While uh, everything uh, is, any, uh, any, everything is, as long as it exists, but and everything can also be its opposite, meaning it could also be nothing. And therefore, for Hegel, being is, is also becoming. There is no strict or fixed formula, which is true. Everything is constantly passing into its opposite. And this is, of course, somehow uh, illustrated by the dialectical process of Hegel. Remember the thesis? the antithesis and then the synthesis. So the thesis is the A, the antithesis is the not A, and then of course you come up with the synthesis. So that's how one example of uh, distinguishing the Aristotelian notion of being with some other philosophies. In this case, I have used as an example, uh, Hegel's notion of being. So uh, the, there are crucial consequences that follows from this fundamental divergence of doctrine regarding being. Okay? Because for Aristotle, being, God as a being would be definite. He cannot change. But in Hegelian conclusion, all reality is dynamic and therefore God himself can change. God becomes 
the process of becoming. Now, of course, that notion of being as a process would have its own, you know, uh, following. And, well, there are many other contemporary philosophies now that follow that kind of thinking of being as a process. Now, let's move on to the next. Being, existence, and essence. So these are very crucial metaphysical concepts. Now, essence or essentia is that by which a thing is. The esse, what a thing is. Esse. The intrinsic cause of existence is esse or essence. So, essence is that by which a thing is what it is. It is the source of all the necessary and universal properties of a being. It is what makes a being what it is. Sometimes you call it the whatness. Okay? And is itself necessary. So the properties of this being would be necessary, universal, eternal, and unchangeable. So it makes, uh, the essence makes what a car is, what makes an animal is, what makes a man is. Okay? It, it will actually be the part of the comprehension of our uh, uh, comprehension of the concept. For example, let's say, let's use again ball pen. So what is the essence of a ball pen? What makes the ball pen what it is? What is the essence? Well, then you can, you have to think of the essential, necessary, and changing elements or properties of a ball pen. Ball pen will always be an instrument for writing. It will always be, uh, it will always have a ballpoint. It will always have an ink. So these are the necessary properties, universal properties of ball pen. And that applies to all ball pens. So that would be the essence of a ball pen. Okay. So the act to which it refers is existence. So it will have, it exists as, the ball pen exists as a writing instrument, as uh, with ballpoint, with ink, etc. So, both existence and essence are realities. The one in the entitative order, meaning by entity, specific existence, and in the order of quiditative order, meaning the whatness. Okay? Now, we have mentioned, we have distinguished a while ago two kinds of being. The notional being, the ensracionis, and the ens uh, reale, the real beings. And so, the existence of a notional being, meaning ensracionis, is only notional, meaning it exists in the mind. Okay? Uh, its essence, too, is also notional, meaning it's, it's rational. But in the case of real created being, the existence of that being is a real actuality, meaning it exists in the, in, well, in the actual reality, not in the mind. Now, there is a distinction between the essence and existence in real created beings. Real created beings. What do you mean by real created beings? Because uh, there is a distinction between uh, a created and uncreated being. The, create, the, the uncreated would be the infinite being, and this will refer to God. The created finite being would be all the things all the beings that God created. So God alone, in God alone, do, does uh, essence, including existence, are identical. Meaning, in God, essence and existence are the same. Okay? God is both, is, exists according to its, its own essence. There's no distinction between the essence and existence of God. But in creatures, there's a real distinction between essence and existence. Because in creatures, first of all, existence is participated, it is diversified and multiplied, not by reason of itself, but by reason of the essence which it actualizes, which, is, which actually is also participated, diversified, and multiplied. Right. So, for example, you talk of uh, the essence of a ball pen, but when the ball pen exists, 
you're going to have several ball pens. So you think of writing instrument with ink and ballpoint, and there are many other objects with the same sharing the same essence. So there's a difference between the essence and how this essence is manifested in the existence of objects. But what about God? Well, God is alone. God is himself. And therefore, what we consider to be his essence would be his own existence. There are no other gods, but only one. And therefore, no distinction between, no real distinction between his essence and existence. Now, let's go to the transcendental properties of being. So equally extensive with the concept of being are the concepts of good, true, one, and beautiful. You call these properties as transcendentals. Why transcendentals? First, they are common to all beings. They exceed in extension all the lower classes into which reality is divided. Meaning, all beings would be one, all beings would be true, all beings would be good, all beings would be beautiful. So everything that exists, every being is good, true, one, and beautiful. But what do you mean by everything is true, good, beautiful, uh, one? It means in the metaphysical sense, which means it, it's, it's like this. Anything that exists is one. It's, it's a unity. So don't think of one in the mathematical sense, but one in the metaphysical or ontological sense, which means that it is a unity. It, it, it has a unity. Anything that exists, has it has its own identity. Okay. Second, that it is true. Now, truth is the object of reason. And as far as we can think of a being, we can, we can think of it, then it becomes the object of our reason. And the object of our reason is true. So a being is true because we can know, we can think of it. Now, what about good? Good is a perfection. And existence is a perfection. So anything that exists is perfect in the sense that it is good in the metaphysical sense. Of course, there are many different gradations of perfections, but we don't, we don't understand this in the, you know, in the ontological sense. And of course, lastly, anything that exists is beautiful because it has its own perfection. So being good, uh, one, true, beautiful, they're all convertible. Okay? So being and true are convertible, being and one are convertible, being and beautiful are convertible. That's the meaning of the transcendental properties of being. So the mere fact that a being exists or something exists as a being, it is a unity, it is a truth, it is a good, and it is something that is beautiful. But of course, we have to understand these properties metaphysically or transcendentally. So, Again, so when you say all these perfections, we find this uh, fullness, the, the fullness of this entity in, in the being. Okay, so uh, now let's go to the categories of being. So we talk of the ens rationis and then the ens reale. Now let's focus on the ens reale, the real beings. The real being is divided but of course, this is not a very strict logical division, but a but a process of, anal uh, of analogy. It is divided into finite and infinite. Of course, we already said that the infinite being is God, the uncreated being or the creator. The finite beings are the created beings. Okay? The finite beings are the created beings. They are the creatures. Okay? Now, the finite being is divided into the supreme genera or the genus, like substance and accidents. And accident is further divided into quantity, uh, quality, 
uh, relation, action, passion, place, time, posture, and habit. Or sometimes that is translated as possession. These nine accidents, together with the supreme genus substance, are the ten Aristotelian categories into which uh, a supreme classes all being is divided. So all beings can be categorized either as substance or accident. And the main, the primary being there, of course, is the substance. So let's discuss what the substance is. Uh, substance are unique in being independent things, meaning they exist in themselves. They don't need anything for it to exist. Of course, aside from the fact that these substances are created by God, but when you say substance, it exists in itself. It does not depend on some other, you know, substances. Of course, of course, God not included for it to exist. So, the accidents, on the other hand, they all depend on the substances. So, the qualities, for example, of colors like uh, the, uh, red. Red does not exist in itself. It has to exist on something else. Okay. Or, for example, the accident of quantity. It, uh, it cannot exist in itself, uh, meaning you cannot see uh, two running around. You will see, well, two people running around or two cars. So you need the substance, the cars, for you you know, to see two. Okay. Of course, you have the instructions, the concept of two. But it exists in our in our mind, not in the you know in the real uh, in reality, meaning in the in the external world, right? So, uh, so the qualities are the qualities of the substances. The quantities are the amounts and sizes that substances come in, and the relations are the way substances stand to one another, and so all the other uh, categories or accidents that we have mentioned. Now, Aristotle offers four possible notions for being, or for the being, the substance of something. So how could be uh, a, something be a substance of something? First, of course, we have mentioned the essence. Okay, so uh, a substance is what is uh, what it was to be, you know, to be this particular thing. The second interpretation of substance would be the you know that it is something universal like the platonic forms and third that the substance is the genus like for example the genera to which a substance belongs and subject meaning the subject here is either matter or form or the compound of matter and form we're going to discuss later on the matter and form now this means that if x is a substance the substance of something then that substance of x might either be one the essence of x or b some universal uh, predicated or applied to x and let us see it is a genus that an x belongs to like, for example, say, what is the substance of man? Well, you can say, oh, you can say, if you define man as a rational animal, then animal would be a substance because it is the genus to where man belongs to. And lastly, it is the subject of which X is predicated. Okay, so, so man would be the subject to which existence or reason is predicated. So, what is substance? Well, the answer of Aristotle then is, a substance is the essence. What an object really is. But there's a problem there because all the categories we have mentioned are or definable. They also have their own essences. Because of course, you cannot, uh, the colors will have its own essence. The numbers will have its own essence. But, According to Aristotle, the essence of substances 
or of a substance is different from the essence of the accidents. The essence of the accidents is only secondary. Why? Because it only exists in the substance. Like for example, we say tall man. Well, tallness is it has its own essence, but it cannot exist in itself. It has there must be a man for tallness to exist. So tallness is only secondary, while man as a substance has the primary essence. Okay? So the essence of the substances or of substance is primary. Therefore, definition and essence are primarily in what, without any qualification applies to substances. And only these primary essences can be considered as substances. So for, for example, the species, when you say species of a genus have an essence in the primary sense. Now, consider man. Man is a species. And so there is an essence of what man is. But let's use again the example that we used a while ago about tall man, or let's say white and tall man. White and tall man is not a species. So even if there is such a thing as the essence of a white tall man, it is not in any, in any rate a primary essence. The primary essence would still belong to the substance man because man is the species. Okay? The qualities, the accidents will have essence but only a secondary essence. Now, let's talk of individual substances. <clears throat> Individual substances, which are considered to be a hylomorphic compound of matter and form. So, what would be the essence of an individual substance? By individual substance, a corporeal physical substance. The essence of this hylomorphic compound would be its form, not its matter. So, Aristotle says that. By form, that means the essence of its thing and its primary substance. So when he speaks of substance without matter, he means the essence. So it is the form of a substance that makes it the kind of thing that it is. So when you say essence, the form, so what would be the essence of a man? The essence of a man would be his form. And the essence of a ball pen, as we have previously defined, would be the form of the ball pen. So the, the form is a substance, and it makes this substance the kind of thing that it is. Okay, so therefore, it is the form that satisfies the condition initially required for being the substance of something. So the substance of a thing is its form. Of course, we're going to ask, what is this form? What is and what is matter? So let's go now to matter and form. I already mentioned the theory of hylomorphism. And it explains the composition of, well, individual substances. Now, the term hyla means matter and morphe means form. It explains that all individual corporeal, or meaning physical substances, are composed of matter, highly, and form, sorry. So now you figure that when you say substances, there are different class types of substances, and the individual or corporeal substances is distinguished from the spiritual substances, like the soul or the angels, right? So. What is matter? Matter is the indeterminate but determinable component, while the form is the determining component. Well, that's rather very, very, very abstract, you know? uh, very much similar to the other concepts that we have discussed. It's very abstract. Okay, anyway, well, I already uh, explained to you that metaphysics is an abstract science. So we're dealing here with, and it is. Uh, it belongs to the highest degree of abstraction, the third degree of abstraction. So uh, we, ne we need to be more uh, imaginative 
uh, in trying to understand all these concepts. Anyway, so let's let's continue. So matter is the indeterminate but determinable component. Well, the form is the determining component. Okay, so matter. So when you say indeterminate, uh, it it's still potential. It cannot be it it cannot be identified yet if it's just the matter, right? So according to Aristotle, the business of the substance refers to its matter. To its matter. What do you mean by it refers to its matter? It's the matter. Well, the the matter matter may may be indeterminate but it it is actually the one that gives the the, uh, the object its thisness what is this thisness it is the characteristics of a being set of characteristics of a being that make it that particular being remember that all things have thisness okay not just people in animals so for example a rock will have individual essence which makes it just this rock and not other one okay so uh your 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 particular a dog for example will have its own business its own you know a set of characteristics to make, make it this and it is based on its matter based on its matter uh of course we have said it is indeterminate but it is determinable uh for example uh say well uh if you are going to construct a house for example uh you will need some materials right you will need some uh steel wood cement sand uh all the, all the materials that you will need to construct a house. If it's just the materials, then you cannot determine what it will be. Okay? It will need the form. It will need the form in order that you can determine what it will be. So when construction starts and the workers and the engineers start putting all the pieces together, they're actually applying now the form. Okay, they are applying for, and then eventually, now you can determine uh, that it is a house or that it is a building or whatever structure. But the point is that it is indeterminate, but it is determinable. And it is the form that determines the matter. Okay, now, so let's focus on the form. The focal now, form now constitutes the essence. So when you say essence, as we have already mentioned, that for Aristotle, when he mentions essence, it is the form. It is the set of qualities that make the object what it is. That means quiddity, the whatness of the substance. So the quiddity, the whatness of the substance refers to its form. Whatness or quiddity refers to those characteristics that, uh, that a particular substance shares with other substances. Thus, for example, the quiddity of a rock are those qualities that make the rock a rock and similar to other rocks. Now, how do you differentiate that, that from thisness? Well, thisness would be the specific qualities of the rock that makes this particular rock. But it has an essence, a form, that it shares with all other rocks. Now, consider your, if you have a pet dog, the dog has a whatness it has a form it has a quiddity set of characteristics that makes it similar to other dogs but your dog is specific it has its own business because it has its own qualities that is unique to itself that makes your dog this particular dog okay that's the meaning of business and what makes it different from other dogs would be its, like, like, like for example, so a dog would be, what would be the essence of a dog? What would be the whatness of a dog? You can say a dog is an animal with four legs and barks. So that would be the 
form of a dog, the whatness of a dog. But the question is, how does your dog bark? What is the color of your dog? What's the color of the of the legs? What is the form? What is the shape of the of the leg of your dog? What's the facial expression of your dog? What's the name of your dog? These are all based on the matter, on the physical qualities of your dog. And it makes your dog unique, different from other dogs. That's the business of the dog. So matter is becomes the principle of individuation because, well, there may be many possibilities from which something else may be actualized, but because matter is something physical, then it individuates, meaning the thisness makes this particular object or being different from other objects. So the thisness provides the individuality, you know, the principle of individuation of the being. The form signifies actuality, while matter signifies potentiality. What do you mean by potentiality? Because, again, this particular matter, in general, could actually receive many different forms. Okay, so we're talking here of matter in the in the in the general sense, not matter in the in the specific in the specific sense. Okay. Oh, by the way, just to just to explain that a little bit further, uh, there's a distinction between primary matter and secondary matter. The primary matter is the one that signifies potentiality. Okay because it could be anything. But the secondary matter is the matter that already received the form. Like for example, in the case of this dog, it already, it, it, it's already a secondary matter because it already received the form. Now, let's go to the next concept here, uh, potentiality and actuality. The concepts of matter and form do not adequately account for the nature of corporeal or individual or physical substances or reality. And of course, it does not also account for the change or development that it undergoes. Physical or individual realities or objects do not just have actual nature or essences. They also have their potentialities, the potential to become something else. And this is where we can now combine uh, matter and form, possibility and actuality. Aristotle describes this process of change through the notions of potentiality and actuality. A developing physical object goes through the process from potentiality to actuality. So we have said that matter is the principle of potentiality in the form is actuality. So, so potentiality is associated with matter and actuality is associated with form. Now take, for example, a seed. A seed is not just a seed on the ground. It has the potentiality to become a tree or to become a particular plant, a shrub, or a vegetable that results from the form that guide its process of development. So the, the seed has the potency to become something. In becoming a tree, for example, the seed loses the original form that makes it a seed. So when it becomes a tree, it's no longer a seed, but the tree is already pot is present potentially in the seed. That part of the seed, so what, what the part of what makes a seed is its capacity or potentiality to, to take on other forms that were potentially there. So remember, for example, uh, in the case of a child or in the case of the baby, it already contains the potentialities of what it will be when it becomes an adult. Therefore, the seed cannot just, you know, cannot become something else other than the forms already within it. Uh, the seed of um, of say a mango cannot become avocado okay or uh, this particular person uh, with these uh, genes 
or heredity will not turn into into something else other than what has been determined by the uh, potentials that are already contained in the genes so in other words something cannot turn into a different thing different from what the form already determined inside that particular being now so you have the uh, potentiality and actuality so it's the form that makes something actual the matter receives the form so the form the matter is potential and the form is the principle of actuality so nothing cannot you know develop into something without matter and form everything has potentiality and actuality but in the infinite in the infinite being in god there's no distinction between act and potency or actuality and potency because god cannot become anything else other than other than himself he's a pure act and he's a pure form does not have any uh does not have any matter at all because he's purely immaterial or spiritual substance now let's go to the four causes aristotle describes the changing world or the physical realities in the world through the four causes that operate in the world so these causes explain why a particular event or a particular thing happen or why things are the way they are so this is another explanation of how reality uh, or how particular beings come to be so the first is the material cause so the material cause that's actually matter is that which something is made of so for example say uh, the chunk of a bronze is what made up a bronze statue or the organic material of the plant makes up the plant itself when you construct a house then the materials needed for construction of the house they are the material cause next is the efficient cause this is the origin of the process that produce the thing or object so in the case of the statue the sculptor and his tools are the efficient cause of the statue in the case of the plant the action of moisture nurturing soil and sunlight actualize the seeds potential and therefore it becomes the act the the plant in the case of house construction the efficient cause would be well the the laborers the engineers and the process of putting the pieces together that becomes the efficient cause because uh that's that's what puts the houses together the workers construction workers the engineers the architects the process of you know uh, putting all these pieces together the, the, the process of mixing the sand and the cement etc etc that would be the efficient cause next is the formal cause this is the essence of the thing or the object so it's coming from the form so again we say the form is the uh, what it makes what the object is it is being actualized in matter so when a sculptor for example starts working on the chunk of the bronze he has the form of the statue in his mind the form of the seed that causes it to grow into a particular plant is already in the seed what about in the construction well the formal cause of the construction of the house would be the design or the architectural design the plan that the workers are following in you know putting in putting the pieces together and mixing you know in constructing the house so that's the formal cause of the house and lastly the final cause the final cause is the end or the purpose or function of the thing what is this for what is the purpose of this object what is its end what is its use what is its final use okay so for an artificial object for example like a statue it could be well one to portray or depict the image of someone or something or probably an event and in the case of the uh, natural object like the plants it could be the final cause is to bear fruits or to bear flowers or in the case of the house the final cause would be well to be a place of 
residents. Okay? So these are the four causes. Now, what about the unmoved mover? Aristotle talks about the, we have been talking about the infinite being, the creator. And Aristotle identifies actually as the unmoved mover. The universe or the physical world is composed of, you know, restless and changing entities. These are all potentialities you know, being actualized every moment. Everything is actualized every moment. Now, the question is, what could be the first cause of all this? Now, matter, since it is just a bundle of potentialities, cannot be the first cause of the actualization of all these things, of all these uh, physical objects. These changes or motion need an explanation. It will need a being which started all these actualizations or motions. The one that actualized everything or the one that actualized the first set of things and then set everything in motion. So uh, for the Greeks, a universe with, which without a uh, beginning is nonsense. Must have some beginning. There must be some beginning. The one that started it all. And Aristotle calls this the unmoved mover. So the unmoved mover is the highest sort of reality and its supreme activity is thought. But the object of its thought is itself. Of course, the unmoved mover would be later on by St. Saint, Saint Thomas would identify that as the God, great God. But of course, Aristotle being, uh, well, a Gentile or a non-believer or pagan has a different conception of from the God of Aquinas or the Christians because the God of the Christians is a personal God. But for the Greeks, this is, it's not a personal God. Okay. So I think that's a rather long explanation of the metaphysics of Aristotle. That concludes my presentation of the metaphysics of Aristotle. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, this is Job Anders once again, and welcome to my lectures in Theories on Reality. And for this uh, lecture, I will be focusing on uh, metaphysics and Aristotle.